Vijf euro hè man. Dear Tishek, mevrouw de minister van staat, heren ministers van staat, geachte vice-rector, dear ambassador, monsieur le président du, du PPE, dear secretary-general of the European Parliament, 
geachte decaan en eredecaan van de faculteit Sociale Wetenschappen, beste directeur van het Instituut voor de Overheid, een warm welkom aan de familieleden van Weile minister van Staat Wilfried Martens, beste schenkers van het Wilfried Martens Fonds, beste collega's, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dierbare studenten. As chairman of the KU Leuven Wilfried Martens Fund, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth Future of Europe lecture. At previous editions, Future of Europe was not yet a popular hashtag. It was not as popular as it is now, and it was not even a hashtag. But since then, debates about the future of Europe have gained prominence, thanks to Brexit. And because Ireland plays, plays such a crucial role in this, we are very happy and also proud to have you, Prime Minister, here with us this evening to share your views on the future of the European Union. I struggle, I overcome, or in Latin, luctor et emergo, was the motto of Minister of State Wilfried Martens, former Prime Minister of Belgium and EPP President. It would certainly apply, I struggle, I overcome, to the current state of affairs in the European Union. Wilfried Martens, who studied at this university, never retired from fighting for European integration. And in order to preserve this particular European heritage, the Wilfried Martens Fund was created at his alma mater, this university, an initiative of the EPP led by the successor of Wilfried Martens, President Josef Dahl, and by Minister of State, Mrs. Mietzmet Martens, for which we are still very grateful. The fund was launched in December 2014 in Brussels. Since then, initiatives have been taken and activities have been organized, proved by the series of pictures we just saw a couple of minutes ago. As you might know, Prime Minister, the KU Leuven is the oldest university of the Low Countries. It's also the largest of Belgium, and according to Thomson Reuters, the most innovative university in Europe, even the third year in a row. As you might understand, we even tend to believe this index. <laughs> Equally important, this is a European university, with students from everywhere around the world, as this particular audience shows you. At a later stage this evening, you will be introduced more extensively, but before turning to your Future of Europe lecture, we will first announce the result of two other initiatives of the Wilfried Martens Fund, the thesis prize and the scholarship. I therefore now give the floor to Professor Annie Hondegem, member of the Fund's Management Committee and of the jury of the Wilfried Martens Thesis Prize 2018. Professor Hondegem, you have the floor. I haven't said anything, so I don't deserve an applause yet. Okay, <clears throat> excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear students. The Wilfred Martens Thesis Prize 2018 awards the best KU Leuven thesis written in 2017 on one of the topics of the fund. On behalf of the jury, it is my pleasure to present you the jury report. We considered four applications dealing with subjects as diverse as the free movement of sports, men and women, the energy union, political foundations, and the Treaty of Rome. The applicants are all KU Leuven alumni from various teaching programs at our university. The jury was pleased with the academic quality of all four master theses and made its decision based on originality, the motivation of the candidates, and the goals and spirit of the fund. Actually, we choose to award two prizes. The first prize goes to Kimberly Feldewert, Master in European Studies, for her thesis entitled Political Foundations as Foreign Policy Instruments? Question mark. German Stiftungen before and after the Brexit referendum. Congratulations.
The late German federal president Herzog called the famous German political foundations or Stiftungen effective and proven instruments supplementing the German foreign policy. Applying this definition, Ms. Felderwert analyzed the activities of the London and Brussels offices of the German Stiftungen during the Brexit referendum campaign and found out that, indeed, they acted as foreign policy instruments of both Germany and their respective affiliated parties. Shedding light on the role of a non-traditional foreign policy actor and the vast importance of political foundations combined with the topic issue like Brexit and the referendum instrument, the topics of these, this thesis would certainly have interested Wilfred Martens. The jury also very much appreciated the readability and originality of the thesis. May I invite Minister of State, Mrs. Mitzmet Martens, who was a member of the jury and has read all the theses to hand over the first prize to Ms. Kimberly Felderwert. Dear Prime Minister, dear members of the jury, dear ladies and gentlemen, Brexit has dominated the political agenda in the United Kingdom, the European Union and beyond and will continue to do so for years to come. I remember watching David Cameron's Bloomberg speech during my first year at Cardiff University. I was not only fascinated by his speech and the potential impact, but also by following the political developments, the referendum and the aftermath from within the UK as a German citizen. To bring these two perspectives together, in my thesis, I chose to assess the working processes of the six German political foundations in this matter of European political importance. I chose these foundations because they're understudied entities and I expected them to play a huge role in German foreign policy. Wilfried Martens himself paid a lot of attention to the difficult position in the UK and the European integration process as well as to the role of German political foundations in the EU's applicant countries. Therefore, this thesis truly focuses on a topic which were close to him. I would like to thank the Wilfried Martens Funds and the jury members for their positive evaluation of my work and their ongoing support of academic education and research activities. My further thanks go to the entire Master of European Studies team who made my time here at KU Leuven the fascinating, valuable and challenging experience that it has been. It truly prepared us to work in European affairs in Brussels and beyond. To the directors and the staff of the Foundation's London and Brussels offices, who shared their personal insights on their Brexit-related work with me. And, of course, to my supervisor for his continuous support, advice and encouragement. Lastly, I would like to thank my friends and fellow students, many of whom have proofread this thesis and are here tonight, my partner and my family for always fully and unconditionally supporting me in all my dreams and aspirations, whether at home or abroad. Thank you very much. The second prize goes to Mr. Andre Moraru. Master of Science in European Politics and Policies for his thesis entitled The Efficiency of Public Administration Reform in the European Commission, the case of the Energy Union Project Team. Also, congratulations to him. His thesis is of high academic quality 
and also the scientific rigor in which Mr. Moraru has written his master thesis pleased the jury very much. The thesis is structured as an explanatory case study of the Energy Union project team, one of the seven project teams of commissioners introduced under the Juncker reforms. It focuses on the stage of policy formulation in the case of the proposal to recast the Renewable Energy Directive. Next to the document analysis, the thesis is based on a large set of interviews with European Commission officials plus outside stakeholders. One of the interesting results is that the coordination process is more inclusive, which is one of the reasons why the reforms can be considered successful so far. May I again invite uh, Mr. Of, Minister of State, Mrs. Meet Smith Martens, to the front to hand over the second prize to Mr. Andre Moraru. Your Excellencies, distinguished members of the jury, ladies and gentlemen, dear students. For being awarded the second thesis prize, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the Wilfred Martins Fund, to the jury of the thesis prize, to Ms. Uh, Mirt Smet Martins in particular, to my supervisor, Professor Dr. Katja Biedenkopf, as well, to my alma, as, as well as to my alma mater, KU Leuven. It is a privilege to stand before you tonight in remembrance of Wilfred Martins, a true and committed supporter of the European Union for which he has dedicated his life. The, EU is in, the EU's institutional infrastructure is part and parcel of its future. In the words of Wilfred Martins, the ultimate point of institutions is the service they can render to people. But their significance remains hidden because no one can estimate their beneficial effects. This is what I focused on in my thesis on public administration reform in the European Commission. I firmly believe that, any, um, that the performance of public administrations underpins any debate on the future of the European Union. The award represents a validation of my academic undertakings, undertakings for which I am thankful. Going forward in the service, in service of the European Union, I will remember this evening and the ideas of Wilfred Martins with humility and appreciation. Thank you. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, uh, it is a great honor for me uh, as a member of the jury for the Wilfrid Martins uh, Scholarship to present to you the jury report of the Wilfrid Martins Scholarship 2018-2019. The MEP program, Master in European Politics and Policies program, is an internationally accredited advanced master's program with an explicit international and comparative orientation, studying the political and policy challenges of the public sector in Europe. And our student body is internationally composed. And in the past, we were happy to award a scholarship to students from Serbia, Ukraine, and Albania. The opportunities offered by the Wilfried Martins scholarship are great in strengthening our outreach to students from countries of the Western Balkans and the Eastern Partnership. 
And this year there were six applications. After having studied the candidates' files, the jury considered four applications from three different countries, Azerbaijan, Serbia, and Montenegro. The four candidates were interviewed through conference calls, after which the jury took a unanimous decision. The jury took into account the academic aptitude, the motivation of the candidate, and the goals and the spirit of the fund. The jury hence decided to award the scholarship 2018-2019 worth more than 10,000 euros to Ms. Sanja Bulatovic from Montenegro. Congratulations. <clears throat> Mrs. Bulatovic has a remarkable and impressive profile not only because of her maturity, but also because of her educational and working background. In her interview, she showed to know the program, the MEP program very well, and how her personal goals fit into what we are offering. She has a clear idea on how she can contribute to both the development of her home country and the relationship between the EU and Montenegro. We also believe that she will be a great student, an enriching student within the student body of the MEP program. With her, excellent, with her excellent academic skills, professionalism, and her clear view on future career development and contributions, she is a well-suited laureate for the Wilfrid Martin Scholarship 2018-2019. May I invite Mr. Joseph Dole, EPP President and member of the Management Committee, of the Wilfrid Martins Fund to hand over the scholarship 2018-2019 to Misania Bulatovic. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear students and professors, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to be here today at Leuven. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to uh, KU Leuven, Faculty of Social Sciences, and to the fund bearing the name of late Wilfred Martins for providing me with this amazing opportunity to uh, spend a year in one of the most renowned and innovative universities in Europe in order to study the Master in European Politics and Policies. KU Leuven is known throughout Europe as a research-oriented university with strong tradition, history, and legacy. But also, as it reaffirms tonight, it is a university dedicated to inclusion and diversity, opening its doors to international students like me. That is why I feel very privileged to be able to join this academic community starting September. I hold a firm belief in the core European values and the importance of cherishing them every day. Coming from Montenegro, the newest NATO member and the front runner in the EU accession negotiations, I would like to dedicate my career to promoting these goals and contributing to our goal of becoming a new member. In order to pursue my professional aspirations and be a valuable asset to my country's European path, I will dedicate myself to learning using all available opportunities and developing new skills. And I will strive towards the highest academic accomplishments. Studying at KU Leuven will be an enriching journey, filled with new knowledge, challenges, exams and papers, but also with new friendships and wonderful memories. I'm looking forward to embarking on this life-changing experience and making this wonderful town, which I'm visiting today for the first time, my home for one year. Thank you very much.
Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, do you think it makes sense? Do you think it makes sense organizing a Future of Europe lecture, awarding a thesis prize to support academic excellence, and granting a scholarship in order to give promising students the chance to study at this university and learn about European politics? Fine, here is the fund. But in order to continue what we are doing, we need your support. Actually, we need your donations. It is as simple as that. Please keep this in mind, because we would really like to, this fund to be long-lived. So visit our website. All necessary information can be found at www.kuleuven.be slash Wilfried Martens Fund. Thank you in advance. We started this evening, similar to the previous editions of the Future of Europe lecture with Viva la Vida, the Coldplay song most of you know and probably have recognized. The song was performed by four of our students, Emile van Nieuwenhuize, bachelor student in political science, Justine Soutaert, bachelor student educational sciences, Jeroen Tuttens, master student biochemics and biotechnology, comes a bit close already to the art of medicine, and Tini van der Kerkhove, alumna sociology. The good news is that they will now perform again before the Future of Europe lecture and before the introduction to the Prime Minister. A thousand years they will perform a song by Christina Perry and David Hodges. Enjoy.
cher Tichoc et président du Finegel, cher Léo Vatkar, cher ministre Ekens, cher ministre Smet, cher secrétaire général Vélin, cher vice-recteur Heimecker, cher ambassadeur, cher membre du Parlement, cher membre de Finegel, cher membre du comité de gestion du fonds Wilfried Martens, cher Steven, je sais que c'est toi le vrai qui travaille sur cette affaire, chère famille Martens, chers professeurs, chers étudiants, mesdames et messieurs. C'est toujours un plaisir pour moi d'être ici parmi vous, à l'Université catholique de Leuven, pour honorer le rendez-vous annuel déjà devenu une tradition de la Conférence sur le futur de l'Europe, organisée dans le cadre du Fonds Wilfried Martens. Or, quel meilleur endroit pour parler du futur que celle qui a été nommée par Reuter pour la troisième année d'affilée, l'université la plus innovante d'Europe Maintenant, on l'aura dit en anglais et en français, et en plus, c'est vrai. Nous avons ce soir l'honneur d'accueillir le Tishok d'Irlande, le président de Finegel, Léo Vratkar. Plusieurs raisons nous ont conduit à penser que Léo serait le choix idéal pour partager avec nous sa vision sur le futur projet européen et surtout aussi pour honorer la mémoire de Wilfried Martens. Et ce n'est pas juste parce qu'il est membre du PPE, je vous assure. Vous verrez. D'abord, il est le premier ministre d'un État membre de l'Union le plus résolument tourné vers l'avenir. Englué dans une crise économique et financière sans précédent il y a quelques années, premier pays de la zone euro à connaître une récession ayant subi de plein fouet les effets de l'explosion de la bulle immobilière et de la crise bancaire, l'Irlande est aujourd'hui l'économie à la croissance la plus rapide de l'Union européenne. 5,2% en 2016, 4,3% l'année dernière, dépassant même les prévisions les plus optimistes. Je connais bien beaucoup de chefs d'État et de gouvernement qui paieraient cher pour pouvoir se vanter des mêmes résultats, mon cher Léo. Il y a beaucoup de jaloux. En misant sur l'éducation, les nouvelles technologies et un environnement favorable aux entreprises et aux investissements, les gouvernements Finegel ont réussi à créer emploi et prospérité pour les citoyens irlandais. Ce n'est pas un radar si un sondage Eurobaromètre paru hier montre que les Irlandais sont le peuple le plus heureux d'Europe. Et Léo Vratkar a été un acteur clé de ce succès. Ministre d'abord et Tichoc depuis juin 2017, Léo a joué un rôle de premier plan dans celui qui passera à l'histoire comme la suite de gouvernement Finegel la plus longue de tous les temps. Ces résultats, mes amis, paraissent encore plus extraordinaires si l'on tient compte du fait que sur l'Irlande pèse depuis presque deux ans, depuis ce fameux 23 juin 2016, le spectre du Brexit. Car si la sortie du Royaume-Uni est un défi pour l'Union européenne dans son ensemble, aucun pays n'en sera autant affecté que l'Irlande. Et non seulement pour l'effet du Brexit dur, avec le Royaume-Uni, quittant même l'union douanière, aurait sur les importantes relations commerciales entre les deux pays. Et je dirais, l'irresponsabilité du gouvernement britannique risque également de conduire à ériger une nouvelle frontière entre l'Irlande du Nord et la République d'Irlande en mettant en péril les efforts consacrés par l'accord du Vendredi Saint, fait pour mettre fin aux 30 années de troubles sanglants qui firent des milliers de morts des deux côtés. Dans ce domaine aussi, Léo Vratka a fait un excellent travail pour protéger les intérêts des Irlandais et une paix si difficilement acquise. Le PPE, autour de notre négociateur en chef, Michel Barnier, et l'Union européenne tout entière ne lui ont jamais fait manquer notre support et il restera très fort. Et je peux t'assurer, Léo, que nous continuerons à être à tes côtés, aux côtés du peuple irlandais, car l'Union européenne est une famille et on n'abandonne jamais les membres de sa propre famille. Et enfin, mesdames et messieurs, <coughs> qui mieux que Léo Vratkar peut vous parler du futur Que sinon, un des leaders les plus jeunes, modernes, dynamiques de notre continent. Et je suis persuadé que les jeunes étudiants qui constituent aujourd'hui la large majorité de notre audience et l'avenir de l'Europe seront ravis d'écouter un Premier ministre d'à peine 39 ans le plus jeune de l'histoire d'Irlande, 
engagé en politique depuis qu'il avait votre âge, il a été vice-président des jeunes du PPE lorsque Wilfried Martens était président du parti. Et il est devenu maître dans l'art des social médias, si peu familiers à notre génération, au point que bien qu'étant à la tête du gouvernement depuis moins d'un an, il est déjà l'un des leaders PPE les plus cités sur Twitter et Facebook. Et dans le bon sens. Cher Léo, <coughs> si j'étais... Comme beaucoup de mes compatriotes, femmes de rugby, je serais probablement moins enthousiaste de t'accueillir ici aujourd'hui, car comme tu le sais sans doute très bien, l'équipe de ta ville, Leitner, rencontrera une équipe française en finale de la Coupe de champions de rugby dans deux semaines. Mais du moment que je suis loin d'être aussi sportif que toi, et je ne peux que te le dire, dans nos deux pays, que ce soit la France ou l'Irlande, les Européens gagneront. Alors, cher Tichok, je voudrais simplement te prononcer la parole en irlandais. Tu m'excuseras si je ne suis pas parfait. Kit Mila Folcha. Merci. Thank you very much, um, Joseph, for that uh, very kind, um, very kind introduction. I uh, actually didn't, hadn't seen that Eurobarometer poll, which said that um, if I picked up right, it said that I, the Irish people are the happiest in Europe. Um, when your prime minister it doesn't always feel like that. Um, it's perhaps the perhaps the case that, that that survey was done on a Saturday or a Sunday because. Um, um, <laughs> anyway, I, I just wanted to, um, want to first of all to, to say uh, good evening to all, and I want to say what a pleasure it is to be here today in this be beautiful city of Leuven, my first time here, and to be in these particularly gracious surroundings of this university, which as you know is one of the oldest in Europe, with a long tradition of intellectual thought and outstanding education. It is, as you know, the university where Erasmus taught the intellectual and philosopher who we still remember today through the student exchange program that bears its name and has been such a success since its creation uh, by our former colleague, the late Peter Sutherland. Ireland's links with this city and this university in fact go back many centuries and it's long been a seat of learning for Irish people. In the late 18th century, the great Irish liberator the man who achieved Catholic emancipation, not just in Ireland, but also in Britain, Daniel O'Connell, was educated for a time in one of the preparatory schools in this city. And today, many hundreds of young Irish people enjoy studying here at the heart of Europe. I want to thank Professor Van Hecke in his capacity as chairman of the Wilfred Martins Fund and his colleagues for initiating this series of lectures on the future of Europe and I'm honoured to have been asked to deliver the fourth of these. The future of Europe is an important theme, I think, for all of us, and one that is exercising the minds of a great many people across the European Union, and one on which I'm delighted to have this opportunity to offer my thoughts. And it is, of course, a great honour for me to speak at this event, named after Wilfried Martens, a giant of post-war European leadership and a founder of the European People's Party. Wilfred Martens believed passionately in the European project, and he believed, as I do, that it is a force for good in the world. And 14 years ago, in a speech he gave, he pinpointed the reason why, even in difficult times, we should be optimistic about the future of Europe, and that is because of our young people across the European Union. As he said, young people today are more European and think more European than ever before. They are our greatest resource to overcome scepticism because they appreciate that you can now study anywhere, invest anywhere, work anywhere, and enjoy protection anywhere in the European Union. Young people benefit the most from European citizenship, and I believe they know it. And in many ways, that was very evident from the results of the UK referendum on Brexit and the difference in opinion that young people held uh, over older citizens. I was 25 years old when Wilfred Martin said those words, starting out on my own political career, 
just newly elected to my local county council. But they are words that resonated with me. Because I saw in Europe a way of ensuring that Ireland would develop economically, socially, culturally and politically. And it offered an opportunity for my country, Ireland, to achieve its destiny. So since my earliest days in politics and even since my student days, I've been a very strong supporter of the European Union and European integration. The European Union, as you know, as it has to be, being a, an alliance or a club of 28 countries, is very much a union of laws and treaties. And sometimes this can make the European Union seem very complex and bureaucratic and even impenetrable. But when it comes to values, the European Union is at its purest and its simplest and perhaps its most beautiful. It stands for and demands respect for human dignity, personal and economic freedom, democracy and equality for all citizens before the law. These are the shared values that underpin our European Union alongside a commitment to peace and multilateralism. As the treaties say, these values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between men and women prevail. These values are fundamental and irreducible and must always be defended. They cannot be taken for granted. As you know, Bulgaria at the moment holds the presidency of the European Union. So it's perhaps a good time to quote Ivan Krastev. In his recent book, After Europe, he observes that tolerance and civility were long the defining characteristics of the European Union, but that today they are often perceived as being among the EU's core vulnerabilities. And in one sense, he is right. There are those who seek to portray the European Union as being weak because it is tolerant. But I believe that's what makes us strong. For a long time, particularly in the post-war period, the scars of war and division in Europe and the personal knowledge of what Europeans were capable of doing to each other and the catastrophic consequences made people wise to and wary of the dangers of populism and nationalism. But decades and generations later, and with the passage of time, that's perhaps a little less certain. Of course, it is essential that each generation should question and test what has gone before. That is where innovation and progress come from, ultimately. But history shows us that Europe has nothing to gain and so much to lose from division and discord. That is the inescapable truth that centuries of history teach us. So those who try to entice Europeans down the pathway of populism or nationalism offer only a dark and desperate future. And I am utterly and unshakably convinced that the European Union offers something else. It provides light to their darkness and antidote to their poison. As my colleague, President Emmanuel Macron said in the European Parliament just last week, dans ce monde et en ce moment difficile, la démocratie européenne, je le crois très profondément, est notre meilleure chance. And I think President Macron is correct. In this world and in these difficult times, Europe is surely our best chance. It is an expression of the hopes that we have for the future. And no matter what may happen anywhere else in the world, Ireland is and will stay a fully committed member of the European Union. It is our home, the one we've helped to build together, and it is where we will stay. And I think there can be no better example of the advantages of EU membership for a small country like Ireland than the unequivocal support which we have received from other EU member states and European institutions in the negotiations on Brexit. Alone, Ireland is small, just an island of five million people. But together with our partners, 27 member states and Europe's institutions, we are very strong. For us, Europe has unlocked our potential 
in ways we could have not previously imagined. And the vision that delivered peace in Europe, in many ways, opened the door to peace in Ireland. Removing borders, bringing people together, and integrating economies north and south. And these values of solidarity, partnership and cooperation, which are central to the European project, have helped to transform Ireland from one of the least developed member states when we joined to one of the most prosperous today. So for us, Europe enabled our transformation from being a country on the periphery of the continent to an island at the centre of the world, at the heart of the common European home, which we've helped to build. Of course, today the threat on our doorstep is Brexit. And in speaking of the future of the European Union, I'm conscious and very conscious that the European Union is going to be a different and in many ways lesser place without the United Kingdom inside it. And I have to say, I deeply regret the decision of the British people to leave the European Union, but I of course respect their right to do so. And I deeply regret that the British government has decided to go further still by leaving the single market, which in many ways was a British invention. And also, in doing so, removes from young people in Britain, young British citizens, their birthright to live, study, work and travel freely anywhere on the continent. There is no doubt that Brexit poses very serious challenges for Europe and it poses particular and unique challenges for my country. No other member state is so closely entwined with the United Kingdom as Ireland is. We are the only member state to share a land border with the UK and we are bound together by geography, by centuries of shared history, culture, trade. We are friends and indeed many of us are family. The tragic history of violence in Northern Ireland is well known to all of us here today and thankfully that violence is behind us. But it took an international treaty, the Good Friday Agreement, to bring us to that point. And if you read the Good Friday Agreement, you see the specific reference in it to the fact that both Britain and Ireland are members of the European Union. We've had now 20 years of peace in Ireland. It's been fragile, imperfect, but it's peace nonetheless. And none of us want to return to the past. And that's why the Irish government, the government which I lead, has been so determined to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts and all that flows from it. Peace in Ireland, power sharing between the two communities in Northern Ireland and cooperation between North and South. And that's why we're insisting that there can be no hardening of the border on our island and no new barriers to the movement of people or to trade. In doing so, we've been supported by our colleagues in Europe because you understand by instinct and by memory the extraordinary ability for the European Union to build bridges where there are once borders. And working through the task force, we speak with a united voice which is clear and unambiguous. The European Union has consistently recognised the unique position of Northern Ireland and the unique situation in which it has been placed by the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. We should not forget that the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union and it is likely that the majority of them will be European citizens even after Brexit because of their right under the Good Friday Agreement to be recognised as Irish or British or both and be accepted as such. So it will be a territory outside the European Union in which the majority of residents are European Union citizens, or at least can be, and that makes it truly unique. So the United Kingdom is guaranteed that whatever its future relationship with the European Union, there can be no hard border, no physical infrastructure on the island of Ireland. And that was agreed in a joint report between the European Union and the United Kingdom in Brussels last December. This is, of course, a political agreement, and it's now imperative that the legal text of the withdrawal agreement, which we're currently negotiated, negotiating, that that is embedded in it, uh, and also in the UK's future relationship with the EU. 
whatever shape that ultimately takes. Negotiations, as you know, are ongoing and are difficult, and there is still much work to be done. And the European Council, made up of heads of state and government, which is following the negotiations closely, will return to the outstanding withdrawal issues when we meet again in June. These include, of course, the Irish border, as well as the framework for the future relationship. So it is essential that we see real and solid progress by June if the negotiations are to move forward. There is less than a year until the United Kingdom leaves and the clock is ticking. And without a solution to the Irish border, there can be no withdrawal agreement and let there be no doubt about that. From Ireland's perspective, we want the future relationship between the EU and the UK to be as close and comprehensive and ambitious as possible. That's very much in our interests as Ireland, it's in the interests of the European Union and the interests of the United Kingdom as well. And I believe the only barrier to achieving this is the United Kingdom's own hard red lines. And if these soften, Europe's position can evolve too, and I believe it will. So along with other member states who have benefited so much from the European Union, we in Ireland have a particular responsibility now to lead and participate in a meaningful way on the Future of Europe debate. We have much to offer as well as much to give, and I firmly believe in that responsibility, and my government relishes that opportunity. The party that I lead, Fine Gael, as you know, is a founding member of the European People's Party, and support for European integration has been at the heart of our philosophy. In his memoir, Wilfred Martins described the Fine Gael leaders that he worked with as Celtic warriors. And I can assure you that our new generation of leaders is equally determined to fight on the world stage for the exact same principles. The 8th Congress of the party of the EPP was held in Dublin back in 1990 and was held in the wake of the collapse of communism only a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it was in fact the first one chaired by Wilfred Martins. And he, speaking in the city of my birth, said, and I quote, if the union is to form the cornerstone of a future greater Europe, we could not look inwards and allow our goals to be watered down. Instead, he demanded new thinking so that we could create a new Europe and a new world. So our debates on the future of Europe are opportunities to imagine that new Europe and that new world and to provide new thinking. The policy challenges that we face as a union are, of course, increasingly global. And I don't believe we can meet those challenges by acting as nation states alone. Issues such as climate change, cybersecurity, mass migration, international trade, the regulation of major corporations, these are all transnational issues and certainly cannot be solved by 28 member states coming up with their own solutions, 28 solutions to different problems. So more so than ever, we need to think and act together. Ultimately, I believe in the Europe of the future, all member states will be small states in global terms. If you look at the list of countries by population, you can learn a lot. In terms of population, there is now only one country in Europe that features in the top 20 in the world, and its population is falling. And I know that population doesn't necessarily equate to economic or military prowess, but there can be no doubt that this is also shifting to the east and to the south globally. So the Europe of the future is one in which we are all small countries in a global context. And that's why, more so than ever, I believe we need to stick together if we're to protect what we have already and promote our values and our perspectives around the world. Our union must embrace the future with a positive and ambitious mindset. We should focus on what we want to achieve together, not as some would have it, on what we want to resist. And I believe the Europe of the future really needs to concentrate on four things. First of all, to continue to do well what we currently do well. 
Secondly, to focus on those big new challenges that affect our citizens and our countries. Third, to consider our competencies. Not everything has to be done at a European level. And where appropriate, some things should be left to member states and regions and also municipalities. And we also need to engage our citizens more and to do so democratically. So taking those first two points, what Europe does well and what challenges we face, we need to consider our resources and how best we can use these to achieve our aims. With Ireland's growing prosperity, we've moved in recent years from being a net beneficiary of the EU budget to a country that is now a net contributor. And recognising how we have benefited in the past, we are willing to contribute more, so long as this brings added European value. For example, even though we're not eligible for them anymore, we are strong supporters of continuing to provide structural funds to Central and Eastern Europe to enable them to unlock their economic potential just as we did. And of course, we will benefit from that ourselves in the long run. And of course, the European Union should continue to fund and fund well programmes and policies that work, such as the Common Agricultural Policy, policies like Erasmus, which I mentioned earlier, funding for research, Horizon 2020, and Interreg. So budgets for fundamental areas such as these should be protected, in my view. But we're also ready to explore how new priorities, such as migration, security and defence, and action on climate change can be funded. As you know, Ireland is a founder member of the single market, and we were among the first countries in the European Union to open our labour market to Europeans from Central and Eastern Europe. And Ireland's economy and society has been enriched by our new residents from Poland and Lithuania, Hungary, and so many other countries. And we believe the single market benefits us all. So we urgently need to complete that single market, complete the digital single market, in a way that serves the interests of all our citizens, our public services, and our enterprises as well. Now is the time, more so than ever, to fulfil the promise of that single market in areas such as insurance, mortgages and loans, so that people can get cheaper loans from European lenders and insurers if necessary. And now is certainly the time to complete the banking union. As a union, we need to always be outward looking and to be a trading union, not one that is ever protectionist, because free trade and free enterprise make everyone better off in the round. And all EU member, st all EU member states benefit from the wide network of free trade agreements that deliver prosperity for our citizens, create jobs and opportunities for business. And I think we need to maintain a high level of ambition on our trade agenda, negotiating future free trade agreements and deepening existing free trade agreements with third countries. And I very much welcome the progress that's been made in recent weeks on the free trade agreements with Mexico and Japan. To a certain extent, the concept of a social Europe has stalled in recent years, and that was perhaps understandable because of the financial crisis which affected so many parts of Europe. But I think now is the time to put some fire back into the engine of social Europe by following through on the proclamation that we as leaders made in Gothenburg last year on jobs, full employment, <coughs> employment rights, and of course pensions for all. The social market economy is very much an EPP idea, very much a Christian Democrat concept, and it's one that we should embrace again and not cede that ground to others. When it comes to tax, we should not accept a situation whereby large corporations can avoid paying tax almost anywhere. And we need a system where all companies pay their fair share of tax on time and where it is owed. And Ireland has already taken extensive steps to close loopholes in our tax laws, and we're now rated by the OECD as being in the top tier of countries when it comes to tax transparency. And while we disagree with the European Commission's view on the Apple case, we are now collecting that money pending the outcome of the court case on the matter. But I also believe that Europe needs to be competitive economically, and this means competition among member states just as states that are members of the United States of America compete with each other. So decisions on national budgets and taxation that funds those national budgets 
should be, be determined by national parliaments and national governments as it is now. Where we have tax reform, it should be done at a global level through the OECD in order to avoid handing advantages to non-EU competitors. The single market, our network of free trade agreements, our competitiveness policies and social Europe deliver considerable benefits. However, there can be no prosperity and there can be no freedom without security to underpin it. And therefore, it's necessary that we cooperate and deepen cooperation in this area as well. With the launch of PESCO last December, of which Ireland is pleased to be a founding member, we're coming together to deal with new security threats. As you know, Ireland has a very proud history of military neutrality. We're not a member of any military alliance. We're not members of NATO, and we don't intend to join either. But we do participate actively in UN, UN peacekeeping operations and EU common security and defence policy operations, such as in Lebanon, the Golan Heights, and Mali. If you examine the security challenges that we face now in the 21st century, they're very different to the ones that we would have faced 20, 50, or 100 years ago. There are new security challenges, cyber attacks, for example, international terrorism, natural disasters, mass migration, and drug and human trafficking. And these all require responses at a European or international level. And we want to be involved in these actions. And we therefore intend to participate in PESCO in ways that are consistent with our long-standing tradition of military neutrality. And in looking ahead, we need to acknowledge the challenge that is posed by mass migration. 2015 and 2016 saw the arrival of unprecedented numbers of refugees and migrants, and this highlighted the fundamental differences in approach between member states. For many reasons, including geography, Ireland hasn't been as affected as other countries have. But we have sought to play a full part in the shared and comprehensive EU response. We are accepting refugees, taking them from the camps in Germany and Italy. We've also sent our Navy, to the upper, our Navy to the Mediterranean on rescue missions and also training missions as well. And I strongly support the call for the establishment of a common asylum policy and system to replace the current one, which clearly isn't working. A small number of countries are shouldering the responsibility of providing refugees with a fresh start in Europe. All of us can and must do more. But even more importantly than that, we need to tackle the root causes. The European Union, if you add up all the budgets, is the biggest aid donor in the world. The international development for the EU, by far, is the biggest in the world. And we're also the world's largest trading bloc, the world's largest economy. So we can offer leadership and partnership. And when I look at the transformation that has taken place in Asia, particularly East Asia in the past 40 years, I can see how successful economic development has transformed countries to which we once gave aid to countries with which we now want to trade. Free trade and free markets and political stability have lifted a billion people out of poverty in Asia. And in the 21st century, we should aim to do the, do the exact same on the continent of Africa. We already work closely on a joint EU-African Union action plan and the post-Cotonou agreement. And I believe we need to develop a dynamic, responsive and political relationship that produces results. This is in our own interest. It's in the interest of African countries and African people. And it should be part of Europe's new mission. If binding together gives us strength, we should welcome those who aspire to and who are ready to take on the responsibilities and the obligations of membership. The prospect of membership of the European Union can be a powerful motivator. And in that vein, I'm thinking in particular of the countries in the Western Balkans. And I strongly believe that we should welcome those countries that share our values and are willing to meet our standards. 
and I salute the ambition that's been shown by the European Commission, which has recommended that accession negotiations should now open with Albania and Macedonia. Of course, there can be no fast track or shortcuts, and the Copenhagen criteria must apply. But nonetheless, we believe that further enlargement into the Western Balkans will bring much needed stability to the region and enhance security for all of us. So I believe we need to look outwards and to engage in the ways I've outlined. But we also need to look within as well to ensure that all that we do as a union is aligned with the hopes and aspirations of our citizens. The debate on the future of Europe shouldn't just happen among politicians and in parliaments. It must happen at all levels, in our schools, in our colleges, in our communities, in our cafes, and in conversations such as this one. As leaders and as politicians, we need to listen as well as to speak. Politicians have two ears and one mouth, and perhaps we should use them in that proportion. In Ireland, we've decided to have a strong focus on this engagement. So last year, we established a citizen's dialogue on the future of Europe, which took as a starting point the ambitions and ideas of our citizens. And I have to say, I've been heartened by the level of engagement so far. While there has been plenty of criticism about certain aspects of the European Union, it has been a sort of critical reflection that is healthy and necessary. And what is evident is that Irish people are deeply committed to Europe and want to play an active role in its future. The European ideal took shape in the second part of the 20th century. And although at that time the world was riven by animosity and fear, some people were imaginative enough to envisage a future in which we were joined together by mutual interest, trust and affection. European values are the values that we advance in Ireland within our European political family and also our relations with the wider world. And I believe Europe has been one of the most successful political projects of the last century. So much has been achieved that once seemed to be the stuff of dreams. Decades of peace in our continent, the single market, the four freedoms, European citizenship, and the defeat of communism and fascism. And with the successes and achievements of the past of our, as our foundation, and with our values to guide us, I believe we can provide a strong direction for Europe, creating more opportunities for our citizens and a better future for all. And that future is very much in our hands. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for your inspiring words. A lot of food for thought. We are going to continue with the debate on the future of Europe as a number of students have prepared questions. The first question will be raised by Sebastian Weismann, who is Dutch, so from the Netherlands, and he's about to finish his PhD in economics, and he will come back to one of the issues you already raised in your speech. Sebastian, you have the floor. So first of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Fratkar, for sharing your views with us today. Um, my question refers to, um, relates to tax harmonization. Um, so the French and uh, the German axis of the EU has raised the idea to harmonize corporate tax rates in the EU. Uh, and also Commission President Juncker um, said in, in his State of the Union speech that this might be a good idea. Uh, and indeed, economically, it makes perfect sense to, uh, to harmonize corporate tax rates in the EU uh, to avoid a race to the bottom and to avoid tax evasion. Um, well, it's well known that uh, Ireland has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the EU and that it hosts uh, many American uh, firms, uh, for instance, uh, including Facebook and Apple. 
uh, but you have indicated to be against uh, tax, uh, to be against harmonization of corporate tax rates. Um, and I wonder why and on which basis. Um, is Ireland maybe a little bit more sovereign than many other countries? Started with the hard question first. <laughs> um, I, I suppose I'd say two things at the outset. Uh, first of all, um, Ireland isn't involved in a race to the bottom on taxation. We've had this 12.5% tax rate for 20 or 30 years. Um, it's a long-standing policy, uh, and we're not going to reduce it any further, uh, nor are we going to increase it. Um, nor is it the lowest corporate tax rate in Europe at the moment. Um, Hungary and Bulgaria, for example, uh, have lower rates than us, and we're not going to be chasing them downwards. Uh, the offering that we offer to uh, companies in Ireland and people who want to invest in Ireland uh, is about a lot more than tax and will be in the future. Uh, we keep those tax rates low, but it's also about attracting talent, it's about good infrastructure, it's about our membership of the European Union. And we often see uh, Ireland is a very good base for American companies in Europe. They all need a base in Europe uh, and in the EMEA region. And Ireland is a good fit because we are in the Eurozone. Uh, we're certain about our place uh, at the heart of Europe. We're English speaking and we have a very pro-business uh, setup in the country. Uh, and while our tax rate is, is very low compared to other countries, uh, like France and Germany, for example, when you actually look at the OECD statistics and you see the proportion that we, actually, that we collect, uh, it's actually higher. Uh, it's higher than France's, for example, uh, because we don't have very many exceptions. Uh, and other countries that often have a high tax rate on paper have any number of ways uh, of avoiding paying that. Uh, and we keep it very straightforward. Um, there's a very small number of exceptions um, all of which are, that are approved by the European Commission, including the patent box. Um, if there is going to be, be reform, though, um, um, you know, we certainly haven't closed the door uh, to tax reform, greater tax transparency. Uh, we're very much of the view that it's not something that the European Union should do unilaterally. And we've cooperated very much with the OECD, uh, with the BEPS process in particular, uh, in closing tax loopholes. Um, we've got rid of things like what they used to call the double Irish, um, no longer accept stateless corporations, and we're one of the first countries to sign up to country by country reporting, where we share with other tax authorities how much tax we collect from each company. And lots of countries haven't signed up to that yet. Uh, but we think all of that cooperation, the same thing would apply to a digital tax, for example, that that should be done at OECD level, because there's a real risk uh, that we, as Europe, if we were to impose these things on ourselves, would just hand advantages to our competitors, to Japan, to the United States, to that big country called the UK that's about to leave. Uh, and that wouldn't be in our interest. Uh, and I also do genuinely and honestly believe that we should have uh, a degree of competition among member states when it comes to tax. It's particularly important for smaller countries and countries on the periphery. Uh, we have a natural disadvantage that we're not at the center. Uh, and just as the case for peripheral regions, we need to be able to do things that are innovative that allow us to compete with the center. Okay, thank you very much. Prime Minister, we'll continue with the second question, which is also a very topical issue, particularly for your country in this period. The question is prepared by Sofia Chevchenko. She's both Belgian and Ukraine and is studying the Bachelor of Political Science. Sofia, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, dear Prime Minister, on May 25th, um, so in about four weeks, Ireland is organizing a referendum on abortion. Um, the referendum is aimed to remove the constitutional declaration of equal value for the life of prospective mothers and the unborn. And so if the constitution is changed, it will become possible to legislate on abortion, like many other Western countries already did before. Uh, you have been campaigning in favor of this, and personally, I also, th I also think that um, this is a decision that who should be free for every woman to make. And finally, my question to you is, why do you think a referendum is the right way to decide on this issue? Thank you. Yeah, well, when, when it comes to the... Um, first of all, Sophia, thanks very much for the, for the question. Um, when it comes to... Uh, having a referendum or not, it's not something on which we have any choice. Uh, Ireland is unique uh, in that our constitution belongs to our people. And the only way we can change our constitution is by a popular vote, uh, by referendum. 
So in some countries I know it can be done by Parliament or two-thirds of the Parliament. That's not an option for us. Uh, we can only do it uh, by putting the question to the people. Uh, and back in 1983, when Ireland was a very different place, a much more conservative country, uh, the people decided to write into our constitution uh, a ban uh, on abortion with the exception uh, of where the mother may die as a result of the pregnancy. Um, but over the years, it's become increasingly apparent to people um, that that just isn't working. Um, roughly nine Irish women uh, every day uh, travel to the United Kingdom. They get on the plane or on the boat uh, to end their pregnancies in Britain. Uh, and increasingly, with the availability of the abortion pill, about three or four Irish women every day are importing uh, the pill online uh, and are um, ending their pregnancies in their own home. And they're doing that in a way that has no medical supervision, um, no medical support or advice, uh, no counselling, uh, and uh, that can be very unsafe. And I'm a doctor by profession, uh, and I can see why um, that comes with enormous risks for women in terms of their, in terms of their health. Uh, so we embarked on um, a consultation with the public. We set up a citizens' assembly, um, made up of 100 people, representative of citizens, asked them what we should do, uh, and they decided or gave us the advice uh, that we should take, a, take that ban, that constitutional ban, um, out of our constitution, that a, a constitution is not a place to deal with something as complex as abortion. And then our parliament looked at it uh, and came to the same view, uh, and the government decided that we would now put that question to the people, uh, and it is a big decision that people are going to have to make. Uh, but certainly, uh, as leader of government, um, I'm involved in the campaign for a yes vote and encouraging people to take that ban uh, out of our constitution, allowing us to legislate for abortion in certain circumstances based on the idea that we should trust women to make these decisions for themselves, particularly uh, in the early weeks of pregnancy. And after that, we should trust doctors to decide when it may be necessary on health grounds. Okay, thank you. May I add, Prime Minister? May I add a question? Was it always your position, so pro-abortion legislation, or did you change your mind recently? Um, not, not, not recently, but um, I, 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 I have changed my mind, yeah. Uh, and um, um, I, I suppose there's a num number of, re of reasons for that. Um, I, I, it pr was particularly the case when I was Minister for Health. I served for a couple of years as Minister for Health in Ireland, uh, and that's particularly when I became aware of some, some very difficult cases. Uh, there was one particular case where um, a, a woman ha had died um, and um, uh, she was still pregnant uh, and doctors had to decide whether they would keep her on life support uh, so that the pregnancy could continue. Um, and this became a court case, uh, played out in the courts and the decision was finally made, I think it was on Christmas Eve one day, um, that, um, that that the life support could be ended in line with the wishes uh, of the family. Um, but that's not the way these decisions should be made. Uh, doctors should be adhering to what's in their medical books, what's in their clinical guidelines. Uh, they shouldn't have to carry around a copy of the Constitution and seek legal advice uh, when they're making medical decisions. And it's as I became aware and of those kinds of cases that um, I was forced to change my mind on the matter. And then there was just the practical reality of uh, the World Wide Web and the fact that it is now possible for people to import pills over the internet and they do it all the time. And because they're doing it in the way they're doing it, uh, they're not getting medical advice, they're not getting medical support, they're not even getting counselling about alternative options. Um, and when something goes wrong, it could go catastrophically wrong. Uh, so something that was put in our constitution, initially designed uh, to, to preserve health uh, and to prevent abortion, has actually done nothing of the sort. Okay, thank you very much. Third question, different topic. The question is prepared by Victor de Groft, who is Belgian. We also have Belgian students here at this university. He's currently a master student in the public management master program at the Faculty of Social Sciences. Victor, you have the floor. Uh, dear Prime Minister, as we are here at the Future of Europe lecture, I want to ask you something about a topic which is often mentioned in discussions about the future of Europe the European Union, and especially when people discuss the so-called demographic deficit that would characterize the European Union, the Spitzer candidate system. 
The system is strongly supported by the European Parliament, while the European Council and, for example, President Macron, although he frequently pleads for the introduction of transnational lists, uh, are more reticent. So I, I want to ask you, as a member of the European Council, uh, what your, uh, your attitude is towards the Spitzenkandidat system, considering your uh, affiliation with the EPP family, we strongly in favor and we will probably still have the largest group after the elections in 2019 and therefore we'll have the right to uh, choose the next commission president. And I want to ask you what uh, do you think about the idea to introduce uh, the pan-European constituency besides uh, the national ones to elect European parliament. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I, I very much support the um at Spitzen candidate system. It's the system that was used to, um, uh, to elect uh, President uh, Juncker and uh, I think it's a system that we should use uh, on this occasion again. I wouldn't necessarily assume that the EPP will emerge as the largest party. We shouldn't take, take that for granted, but that obviously is um, what, we, um, what we aspire to do. Um, but we also need to adhere to the treaties and the treaties do say that the ultimate decision uh, lies with the European Council. Um, but I believe in that concept very strongly of the Spitzen candidate that we should respect the outcome uh, of the European elections um, while reserving that final check and balance uh, that the European Council makes the final decision uh, legally. Uh, I know people often say that there's a democratic deficit in Europe and, and I think that is true, but um, Europe is perhaps a little bit more democratic than people think. Uh, you know, the European Parliament is elected uh, and makes uh, decisions um, uh, on European issues and European MEPs are elected by people and all the other decisions that are made of course are made by the European Council, made by Prime Ministers and Presidents who are elected by people and I think what we've done sometimes too much as politicians uh, is to go to Brussels, uh, make decisions, sign up for them and then blame it on Europe uh, and there has been that dishonesty among national politicians uh, down the decades. Um, and I think to a certain extent a lot of the Euroscepticism that exists in Britain um, has its roots in that. Uh, national politicians um, signing up for things that they knew to be right uh, in, in Brussels and then going back to their home countries and saying that nasty Europe forced us to do this. When you look at how they voted, they probably voted for it, uh, but they didn't have the courage to explain that, um, explain that to their um, at, uh, to, the, to their people, um, to their people at, at home, um, and I think as well, um, what's probably required is just a greater engagement by national politicians in European issues and explaining to people uh, why those decisions are made and why they're made in their behalf. Uh, on, on the pan-national list, I, I actually think they're a good idea. You know, I, I like the idea of people around Europe having a second ballot, you know, two ballots, one where you elect your local MEP for your region or city or, or town, and the other where you elect some MEPs off a transnational list that would challenge people to think about European political parties and uh, the different policies of the European uh, parties. Um, but I don't um, underestimate the complications in doing that. And uh, when I discussed with my colleagues, what some of them have pointed out is that in some countries, Portugal, for example, uh, I think there are three parties in the EPP. Uh, and that creates difficulties, uh, difficulties for them. Um, so it's not something that we're going to be able to do for the next European elections, European elections held next year. Uh, but I do think it's something that we could do in the future and something I'd definitely like to do. Okay, wait and see in 2024, perhaps another opportunity to have you again as a guest speaker. Fourth question is also the final question prepared by Corrie Cunningham. Corrie is both Irish and Belgian. She studied here at this university, so now she's now an alumna of the MEP program. Corrie, and working now in the European Parliament, by the way, we're always proud of our students when they do well in Brussels and beyond. Corrie, you have the floor. Thank you. So, Antishak, welcome back to Belgium. Uh, I have a question for you on Belgian and Irish relations in the context of the Brexit. So last week you christened the world's largest short sea roll-on, roll-off vessel, Celine, also nicknamed the Brexit Buster, allowing for tons of additional freight to be transported from Dublin port to the continent, in particular Belgium, thus circumventing the UK land bridge. How will this reduce the negative impact of Brexit and strengthen the ties between Ireland and Belgium? And what other projects are Ireland and Belgium putting in place to thwart the negative consequences of the Brexit? Thank you. 
I was um, I, I was I was on that on that vessel, the MV Selene. It is an absolutely huge uh, ship um, that's going to uh, sail from Dublin to um, to uh, uh, Rotterdam and to Zeebrugge, um, and it's um, it's an extraordinary sight to see. Essentially, hundreds of trucks just roll onto the vessel. I think it only has 15 people working on this on, on it, uh, and and carries those trucks to. Um, uh, to the next port uh, where they roll off, and it's just uh, was a fascinating experience to um, uh, to be on, to be on the ship. Um, it's definitely to our advantage to have more direct links between Ireland and continental Europe. Uh, we have loads of flight connections um, already, uh, but we need other connections too. Uh, new shipping lines, um, such as that one, which gives us more capacity. We're also going to have a direct link for the first time uh, between. Uh, the port of Cork and the port of Santander in northern Spain, uh, allowing us to um, essentially trade by sea with Spain, which is something that we, we barely do at all. Um, it all goes through Britain and around Europe and over the Pyrenees at the moment, so it's, it's, it's a new link. Uh, and we also uh, want to uh, connect our electricity network to continental Europe as well. It's already connected to Europe through Britain, but we'd like to have what we call the Celtic Interconnector, which will link uh, Ireland's electricity network our electricity grid uh, between Ireland and France, and that's a project that we're uh, already planning for. Uh, and even if there was no Brexit, it would still be a good thing, I think, uh, to have more direct connections with, um, with continental Europe. Um, but it is a secondary solution, it's not the preferred solution. You know, we still want to be able to trade freely with Britain as we do now, and we still want to be able to use the land bridge um, as the fastest way to get to continental Europe. Uh, so it's something that is happening. Um, it would be happening anyway, it's good anyway, and it does provide us uh, with alternatives to uh, crossing through uh, the British landmass. Um, but um, I'd prefer if it was an extra link rather than a replacement link, if that makes any sense. Okay, thank you very much. In terms of Belgian-Irish relations, are you in favour of including Belgium? Belgium is currently excluded from this new leak. Ireland, the Netherlands, and a couple of Scandinavian countries, as well as the Bel Baltic states. Would you favour Belgium also to be part of this club in a post-Brexit Europe? Oh yeah, absolutely, if, if the Belgian government uh, wants to be part of that. Um, it, it, is, it is a loose group though, uh, you know, so uh, we, we don't, we don't all, all agree on everything, but I think it's fair enough to say that uh, the European Union, when the United Kingdom leaves, is going to be a very different place. Um, France and Germany will be much stronger. Uh, they won't have uh, the UK there acting in many ways as a counterbalance. Um, and also, with the UK leaving, we're going to be um, losing a country that uh, generally was a good, argu a good argument, an arguer, if you like, in favour of free trade, in favour of enterprise, in favour, perhaps, of less regulation. Um, and that compels uh, those countries that are free trading countries in particular um, to come together a bit more, uh, and that particularly involves the Nordic countries, the Baltic countries, um, the Benelux countries, uh, and Ireland, and uh, certainly that group is very informal, uh, and if Belgium and Luxembourg uh, wanted to be part of that, I think it would be a very good fit, but that's entirely a matter for, um, for the Belgian government. But that's not to say, though, I, we, I wouldn't like any club like that to be seen as being exclusive, and you know, when it comes to other issues like agriculture, for example, uh, Ireland is very close to France because we both have big rural economies and big agricultural economies um, and we'd actually have a very different view uh, to the Nordic countries on things like that. Okay, thank you very much. We keep you busy a couple of minutes more, but thank you very much for answering our students' questions. Thank you. Thank you. As a guest of honor of our university, I would like to invite you to sign the book of honor of the KU Leuven. Thank you very much. Thank you. The final word is by our Vice Rector, Professor Bart Reimakers.
Dear Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, at the end of this uh, Future of Europe lecture, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, as being the Vice Rector of this university, to express our gratitude, indeed our gratitude. And our thanks go first to the province of Vlaams Brabant for their financial support, but also to all people involved in organizing and preparing this event, especially people from our university. I would particularly like to thank Minister of State, Mrs. Meet Smet Martens, for her support, her engagement as a jury member, and her presence this evening. Mevrouw Smet, thank you very much for this evening. And I will you also like a souvenir aanbieden van this evening. Alsjeblieft. I also would like to thank especially Mr. Joseph Dahl, President of the European People's Party, for his presence, for his never-ending enthusiasm, for his brightness and for introducing to us Prime Minister Faradkar. Merci beaucoup d'être parmi nous. On this evening, we also had the pleasure and the honor to have an ambassador among us the Irish ambassador to Belgium, Ms. Helena Nolan, is here and she helped us in preparing this evening. Thank you very much on behalf of our university. <laughs> and Mr. Prime Minister, as we would like you to learn even more about the KU Leuven, we offer you a copy of the history book of our university. It's called The City on the Hill. And I think there is a copy available for you. represents what we do at the university, our past, our research, our ideas for the future. And therefore, we would like to offer you, together with a book on the history of our university, Prime Minister, also the results of academic research written, of course, tonight by political scientists. In other words, having heard your speech, we offer you also some food for thought some food to read. And as we all know, on evenings like this, we never offer e-books, we offer proper books. Books that can be read, books that can be given, that can be offered. E-books we don't give uh, on an occasion like this. Let me assure you, I'm not asked to deliver a new speech. I'm not even asked to give a summary of the very rich and thought-provoking ideas you, as a Prime Minister, were offering to us tonight. But let me, to conclude this evening, just point at three elements. First, I think it was impressive to see how many people from different European countries were here among us tonight. Of course, from Ireland, from France, from Germany, from Belgium, from Ukraine, from Montenegro, all over Europe. In a certain way, this evening is a kind of self-evident incarnation of the European idea. An idea that we cherish here in Leuven in many ways. And therefore, I also would like to thank Professor 
van Hecke this evening, because as we all know, he is the inspiring force for the European ID in Europe and for spreading the European ID even beyond our university. Thank you for all you've been doing. <laughs> Secondly, Mr. Prime Minister, I think you've said something very valuable. At the beginning of your speech, you were stating Europe and the European Union is not only about laws and bureaucracy, but also about values. And I think this is something we really should keep in mind. Laws without values are empty. Values without laws are weak. And I think the way you have um, shown us this evening how a European Union can be a union of both laws and values is most inspiring. And finally, I think this evening is also an excellent opportunity to explore and to intensify the relationship between Belgium and Ireland. I was almost tempted to say the relationship between two small countries. But earlier on this week, I had a very interesting meeting with Mrs. Nolan. And she was, in a friendly way, correcting me by saying, Belgium and Ireland are no small countries. They are two mid-sized countries. And I think it's a uh, more stimulating idea to end this evening by being aware that we are exploring and intensifying relations between Belgium and Ireland, between Leuven and Ireland, as two mid-sized countries, indeed. So, thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening, and I hope that this fourth session of the Lecture for the Future of Europe is the beginning of the fifth one next year. Thank you. Sweet the streets I used to own.